morning from our World Headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Markets are on edge. Wall Street gears up for the jobs report today, which is expected to point to a downshift in hiring. Janet Yellen kicks off her visit to China with a warning that Chinese overcapacity in manufacturing poses a risk to the global economy. And it is our exclusive interview with Argentina's president as he turns from hardliner to pragmatist on China. As for the Chinese government, what we've always said is that we are libertarians. And if people want to do business with China, they can carry on business as usual. What I said was that I wouldn't be aligned with communists. More from that exclusive interview a little bit later this hour. Are you ready? Are you ready for jobs day? The whisper number on the Bloomberg terminal is 233. The consensus is 214. Bloomberg has a lower number. Either way, these equity markets were whipsawed. The scorpion sting of oil. I put it to you, there is a lot of geopolitical tension out there with Israel. What's the next step back from Iran? What will Israel do next? Oil is bid this morning. Uh, and again, over $90. It was the biggest intraday uh, top to bottom move in the S&P 500 since October last year. So there was nervousness in geopolitics, nervousness that Kashkari uh, took some of the heat out of the possible rate cut market and the equity market just didn't quite know where to go. Some individual names which got battered yesterday. NVIDIA was down over 3.44%. A slightly better bid this morning. Uh, look at that, 1%. Uh, the likes of AMD absolutely crucified yesterday, down over 8%. Again, a little bit of a turnaround there. NASDAQ futures up a third of 1%. Europe is where we take the catch-up trade from that pressure in the US. Europe plays the catch-up to reprice. Roll it over and have a look at what's going on in the rates market. By the way, money is flowing into money markets. Ten-year yields are flat at the moment. Again, you have got to consider whether it is conflict hedging that is helping the yield stabilize versus prevarication by the Fed. Oil is bid, as I said to you. Uh, Ellen Zetner, we called up with her from uh, Morgan Stanley. She's still talking about four rate cuts. And I put it to you that dollar yen really is caught in the conundrum of uh, verbal intervention by the Prime Minister uh, and a readiness by Ueda to raise rates again. But again, no major impact. We need to see the actual action from the Bank of Japan or the Ministry of Finance before this dollar-yen will really take heed. Now, as I said to you, it was the Minneapolis Fed, Neil Kashkari, uh, who discussed whether he believes they will cut rates this year in the current environment. I wouldn't say they're off the table, but they're also not a likely scenario, given what we know right now. If we continue to see strong job growth, if we continue to see strong consumer spending and strong GDP growth, then that raises a question in my mind, well, why would we cut rates? So investors digest uh, Fed speak. They're also bracing for today's jobs report. That is at 8.30 a.m. Joining me now is our very own Mike McKee on the numbers. Mike, good to see you. Kashkari spoiled everything for everybody, really, yesterday. But these job numbers, I mean, there's quite a differential here. I talked about the whisper number. We've got the consensus number. Depends whether you see these numbers as bullish or bearish. Give me your take. <laughs> well, if we get the whisper number, it is uh, somewhat on the bullish side. And that would... <laughs> make the case for Neil Kashkari, I guess, or at least help him make the case. All of these Fed officials are lashed to the mast right now of the data and the important data today. The jobs report comes in. You take a look at the numbers here. As you mentioned earlier, we're at uh, 214 for the Economist survey at Bloomberg. Whisper number 233. Uh, unemployment 3.8 ticking down. We've been expecting that to go over four. Or we, the Fed, has been expecting it to go over four for months, and it hasn't. Average hourly earnings on a monthly basis will tick up, but on a year-over-year -year basis, base effects included, we get 4.1 percent. Now, the interesting thing to watch in this over overall number is how far above 200,000 is it? Actually, how far above 100,000 is it? The Fed has argued for a long time that a neutral rate, a rate that would leave the unemployment rate steady, is around 100,000 new jobs a month. And we've been over 200,000 for many, many months now. And so at this point, uh, the average is much much lower than what the Fed uh, is, has, or much, much higher than what the Fed has been thinking. You see the, uh, the red line there. So if we get another number above it, it suggests that there's something going on in the labor force, and a lot of people think that might be additional immigration adding to the size of the labor force, which is enabling companies to keep hiring. I mean, on that, what, what do you make of that argument in terms of the controversy? It is controversy 
uh, over the immigration and to what extent it is playing into the numbers? Well, there are questions about uh, if you were uh, an undocumented worker, whether you would answer survey questions from the government. There are questions about whether companies would report having undocumented workers on their payrolls. So there are some questions about it. However, it's otherwise hard to explain why we have had this large jump in the labor force. And so there seems to be a lot of uh, logic to the argument. And then if you look at uh, the two surveys that we get, the household survey and mm -hmm. the uh, establishment survey, the establishment survey has been showing all of these strong gains, but for about five or six months now, the household survey has been showing job losses. And so the household survey would suggest we're not seeing that kind of uh, dynamic with immigration, but the um, um, the uh, Establishment survey suggests we are, so it's going to take some time before we really get a good answer on this. I mean, we've seen a couple of different pieces of, of information this week. The, the wages component in the ADP, that was a bit of a flash. We've also seen services inflation come in at a four-year low. So the question is, looking at these markets, looking at the bond markets, I put it to you that it was the dichotomy between hedging on geopolitical risk and, of course, Fed speak. But here we are. If we get a hot and high jobs number, or on the other side, perhaps a surprise to the downside. Are we set up for quite an extreme price reaction? I think if we get a move to the downside, a significant yeah. move to the downside, your price reaction would be more severe than to the upside because we've priced in upside. Everybody's sort of expecting that. Fed officials now have been talking about it and not moving rates. So that's probably in the markets. If we see a big downside, and remember Jay Powell said if we had to cut, it would be because the labor market softened quickly. Uh, there's probably more scope for a fall in that situation. Okay, Mike, our lies down uh, for those numbers a little bit later on today. That is our very own resident, Mike McKee, on the jobs report. We'll bring that to you uh, on surveillance. Over in China, we've got the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen kicking off her visit with a very clear message. We've seen the PRC pursue unfair economic practices, including imposing barriers to access for foreign firms, and taking coercive actions against American companies. I strongly believe that this doesn't only hurt these American firms. Ending these unfair practices would benefit China. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Jill Decease in Hong Kong. Jill, thank you for joining me. Uh, Yellen caused a bit of a stir in Gangzhou on her trip. Uh, how were her comments received? Yes. Hey, Manis, I think, um, you know, she kind of came out swinging here a little bit with some of these comments on, you know, China really needing to treat American firms better. Um, in terms of the actual China response, we haven't gotten a ton officially yet. That's probably because China's right in the middle of a four day holiday, though. I'm sure we'll get more in the coming days. Um, she actually just did have a meeting with uh, Vice Premier He Lifeng, uh, where he was saying that, look, China and the U.S. have to cooperate, have to listen to both sides. Uh, and, uh, you know, I I think that that's fairly diplomatic, but we've seen in the past how China has responded to these types of comments, um, particularly from Western officials. Usually, uh, the response to um, accusations of overcapacity, industrial overcapacity on China's part, is that um, they've accused the U.S. and Europe of protectionism, overly protectionist policies um, to prevent China from really making inroads um, in the industrial sectors in these areas. So I imagine there's much more to come, especially because she's really only getting started on this trip, Manis. So what is Yellen really trying to achieve with this second trip to China? Some people are saying it's to stabilize the relationship in an election year, but also to show some kind of resilience by the Biden administration going head to head with the Trump message on China and tariffs. Yes, man, as well, look, I think that it's really a two-pronged approach for Yellen here. On the one hand, yes, she needs to communicate this uh, overcapacity message that, um, you know, the, the, the West has kind of been pushing, this idea of some concerns around, um, around China, uh, how it subsidizes some of its companies, and then how those companies ultimately have influence, um, you know, around the world. That's certainly part of it, although obviously there, you know, there's a bit of a balance to strike there just because of the incredible importance between uh, these two economies, the world's 
largest, uh, the U.S. and China. But I think the other part of her trip is really she's there to kind of try to get a feel for what exactly is happening within China's domestic economy. I mean, the economic slowdown within China is one of these, you know, massive stories that we've seen unfold over the past couple of years. How does China shore up these problems it's having, um, particularly within the property sector? We know that China is trying to pivot in the long run uh, toward funneling resources into what it's called new productive forces, this idea of, you know, pumping up electric vehicles, solar panels, um, you know, alternative forms of energy, that kind of thing. I think, um, you know, really just having somebody high level from the U.S. on the ground in China to get a sense of what's going on within the domestic economy is really critical on the U.S.'s part. Okay, Jill, let's see what the rest of the news flow is. Jill Decease in Hong Kong, tracking Janet Yellen's every move. Other stories trending on your Bloomberg Terminal this Friday morning. Samsung sales missed forecasts in the first quarter, but preliminary operating profit rose, and in a string of quarterly declines. The results underscore how demand for memory chips that power modern electronics is starting to rebound after a severe downturn in the industry. And the Wall Street Journal reports that Samsung plans to raise chip investments in Texas about $44 billion. The YouTube CEO, Neil Mohan, says the use of YouTube videos to train OpenAI's text-to-video generator would be an infraction of the platform's terms of service. Mohan spoke exclusively to Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Our terms of service does allow for YouTube content, some YouTube content like the title of a video or the channel name or the creator's name to be scraped because that's how you enable the open web for that content to show up and you know, maybe show up in other search engines or what have you and be available that way. But it does not allow for um, things like transcripts or video bits to be downloaded. And that is a clear violation of our TOS. Uh, and so those are the rules of the road in terms of content on our platform. Apple laid off more than 600 workers in California when it ended its car and smartwatch display projects. And that was at the end of February. Apple began to wind down both initiatives, which were seen as major moonshot efforts in the advance of the company's technologies or enter sizable new areas. Joe Lewis, the 87-year-old British billionaire who pleaded guilty to insider trading, has been spurred jail time by a federal judge in New York. This was at a hearing yesterday. Lewis was sentenced to three years probation and a $5 million fine. An attorney for Lewis said any incarceration would be catastrophic. Lewis had admitted passing share tips to his private pilots and his girlfriend. Coming up, Richard Koop, Chief Economist at Nomura, joins me from the Ambrosetti Forum in Chernobyl to discuss the future of rates and his view on the Goldilocks economy. And more on our exclusive interview with Argentina's President Mele. How it currently feels about Chinese government, we've got it all on Bloomberg. We expect four cuts. We actually expect them to speed up cuts in the fourth quarter of the year because we have inflation coming down faster at that point than the Fed. Um, but I don't think that the, the timing of when central banks globally are cutting is really going to be an issue. That was Alan Zentner, Zentner, Chief Economist over at Morgan Stanley, speaking to the team a little bit earlier, the Ambrosetti Forum in Chernobyl. Beautiful backdrop. My next guest writes this. Given the Fed's historical tendency to give first priority to the macroeconomy, even if that means ignoring rising asset prices, I think it will probably move in the direction of rate cuts if it can confirm that inflation has stabilized. The greatest debate in the world at the moment. Joining me now from the Ambrosetti Forum, it is Richard Koo, Chief Economist over at Nomura Research Institute. Richard, good to have you with me. The debate is what is stabilization in Thank inflation in me. the United <clears throat> States. The PCE still runs a little bit hot, but there seems to be a building consensus. The Fed needs more confidence. What would stabilization mean, Richard, for them to actually begin cutting rates? Do we need to break the 2.5% level on the PCE? Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I think not just this uh, PCE levels, but I must say that Federal Reserve, together with all the central banks that are implemented QEs, 
are facing an unprecedented challenge of how to really tighten monetary policy when there's so much excess reserves already in the system. This has never happened before. This is the first time in history that central banks are, are in the mode to cut rate, uh, to tighten monetary policy with so much money already in the system. And so what that means is that no one really knows what will be the, the right level of interest rates, including all the other uh, rates like natural rates and so forth, because we have never experienced anything like this before. In the past, for example, when Paul Volcker was uh, fighting inflation, he had two tools, or tra traditional central bankers always had two mm -hmm. tools, right? Either you raise interest rates or squeeze the availability of reserves. And Paul Volcker actually used the second one to really cut uh, inflation rates down. He uh, squeezed it so much that short-term interest rates went to 22%. Bankers did not have enough uh, reserves. They all had to get it, and that basically pushed the inflation rate, uh, killed the economy and pushed the inflation rates down. But this time, Jay Powell does not have that option of using the uh, availability of reserves to squeeze inflation out. So everything is on interest rates. And that means interest rates had to be raised much farther than under ordinary circumstances when central bank could use two tools in a nice combination. I mean, those two tools are not completely independent of each other, of course, mm -hmm. but they could use two to uh, really control the situation. Now we don't have that. And so even now, I think there are a lot of people at the Fed who is wondering whether this is the right time to cut rates given you know, where the stock market is. Do you see the risk uh, of them prices, actually having been forced into, Richard, do you see any, I mean, given, given the landscape that you've just laid out for me there, we have oil trading back above $90 again this morning. We have geopolitics playing into the global macro economy uh, as a real risk. Can I ask you, in your opinion, would it be a mistake to cut rates? And might they even have to raise rates? Well, I'm sure Fed wants to cut the rates because these high rates also means much higher budget deficit because the Federal Reserve, this huge amount of excess reserves in the banking system, $3.2 trillion is a liability of the central bank. Central bank has to pay interest on the $3.2 trillion, which is something like $150 billion a year, which reduces the, oh, sorry, which increases the budget deficit by almost the same amount. So this is, I mean, central bank will really want to lower rates so that it won't have to pay so much interest on excess of reserves. Course. But whether that is the right thing to do at this moment, I think a lot depends on where the economy is going. And I don't think we should you... uh, I, be too so deterministic by saying that all oh, the Fed says he, he it wants to cut interest rate and therefore it will. Because I think a lot depends on the numbers coming up. Let's just pivot to, obviously, your, your Japanese house, and, and this will be very, very relevant to you. We have verbal intervention today from the Prime Minister Kishida warning, uh, and Ueda warning that perhaps Japan may need a second rate hike in the second half. You talk about the fallacies uh, of the world, and the fallacy that you put forward, I think, is number three, is that authorities cannot move exchange rates. But to that extent, we've got to deal with what's on the table. Do you think the Bank of Japan will intervene? To what scale? What do they need to do to stabilize dollar-yen, Richard? Well, even though Bank of Japan moved away from zero uh, negative interest rate policy, now we have a very small positive interest rate. Uh, Bank of Japan is still buying bonds, and I think those are sending kind of a mixed signals to the foreign exchange market that maybe Bank of Japan is not all that serious about normalizing uh, monetary policy yet. Well, <clears throat> Bank of Japan is actually doing the tapering by not adding to their holdings of uh, JGBs, but the fact that they're still buying the JGB so that their holdings will not decline or shrink, I think it's given this a signal that maybe BOJ is not all that uh, eager to tighten. But as a result, the yen remained weak, and this weak yen is actually hurting Japanese consumers, Japanese public, in no small way. I mean, it's great for the foreign tourists, great for the Japanese exporters, but for the Japanese average public, 
when so much of the foodstuffs are imported, it's hitting uh, consumers very badly. But then, what is it going and to? So what is it going to take in addition? In addition, what is it going to take in addition to Kishida and to Ueda verbally? suggesting that they're prepared to intervene. We saw this a couple of years ago where they did intervene in the FX markets. Is that enough, Richard, to cap the yen, or do you feel that they do need to do a second rate hike pretty soon to show real intent? Uh, I think Prime Minister's talk uh, would not be sufficient to really move the exchange rate. But suppose if Janet Yellen at the U.S. Treasury also starts saying that uh, the dollar may be too strong and all this protectionist pressure in the United States needs to be watched. If such uh, coordinated movements come out from Washington and other capitals, that can actually move the exchange rate. And if you remember what happened in 1985, September 1985, the Plaza Accord, you know, that's how it was done, that countries around the world basically join in to rein on the dollar so that protectionist pressures in the United States will not go totally out of control. Well, I'm not, I, I'm not privy to what Janet Yellen the might world. have to say about a strong dollar. I, I often hear Treasury secretaries are often chided when they talk about the dollar uh, and its strength. But you do mention the era of Ronald Reagan and you mentioned the Plaza Accord. Yes, yes. So my question would very naturally be, the dollar has been so strong, so resplendent, so unique. Is that something under Trump? Do you, do you, do you envisage some kind of real reference to dollar and maybe even the risk of, of flying a kind of a, of a Plaza Accord under Trump if he comes back to power? Is the dollar going to take center stage in his verbal assaults? Well, the strong dollar definitely helped Trump uh, becoming president in 2016. But once he became the president, he talked about protectionism. And protectionism is the other uh, route to basically help the American workers. But it's not, a, in my view, a, a desirable one because it, it could be very arbitrary. It might uh, allocate resources very badly. Uh, from that perspective, I much prefer Donald T Trump talking about the dollar than the protectionism. But at the current uh, situation, it seems like Trump is more eager to go on the protectionist route, you know, raising um, tariffs 10 percent on all imports, maybe 60 percent on Chinese imports. That, that I, I don't think is the, really the right way to go. The right way to really address this uh, trade deficit issue, I think, is to bring the dollar down. But, that, that, but I don't think that's what Mr. Trump wants to do. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you so much for giving us your time uh, today on the banks of that beautiful lake behind you there. That's Richard Koo. No more research, my guest this morning. A little bit later on, Mohamed El Arian will join the Bloomberg surveillance team from the Ambrosetti Forum uh, in Chernobyl. You're looking at that beautiful uh, backdrop where Richard is. Uh, Mohammed will join us a little bit later on. It's all about the bond market, Fed speak and jobs day. Now we have had uh, quite significant uh, whiplash in this bond market this week. We're trading at 433. Uh, my next guest, uh, Tim Graff, is keen to pick up bonds anywhere between 433 and 450. But what you've got at the moment is a tick higher. Uh, you have had conflict hedging, some would say, in the bond market. Netanyahu warns he's ready to act against Iran. You've just heard from Richard Koo there about the folly uh, of potentially cutting rates. Uh, yields in the United Kingdom at 4.09. Coming up, as I say, Tim Graff from State Street standing by to give us his view on Jobs Day in the USA. Good morning from New York. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manus Cranny in New York. Here's what you need to know. Markets on the edge. Wall Street gears up for today's jobs report, which is expected to indicate a downshift in hiring. Janet Yellen kicks off her visit to China with a warning that Chinese overcapacity in manufacturing poses risks to the global economy. And our exclusive interview with Argentina's president as he turns hardliner to pragmatist on China. 
A very good morning. The stock market is gearing up for jobs day. You've got a whisper number at 233. Stocks are managing to eke out a small gain. Yesterday was virulent. Nasdaq was down 1.6%. Uh, the S&P, uh, biggest top to bottom drawdown since October, but still not a 2% drawdown. We haven't seen one of those in a really long time. Kashkari takes some heat out of the market. Oil is back above $90. This is the, this is the scorpion sting. We're doing things in bonds. We're seeing movements in oil, which is about the Middle East tension. There you go. Oil is $90.69. A couple of stocks to keep an eye on. NVIDIA got battered yesterday, down 3.44%. Of course, adding to the bruising of NASDAQ. Turns it around this morning. Uh, a, a little bit uh, of cheer in NVIDIA. And then you have AMD as well, which obviously took a real smack yesterday, down by over 8%. And that has managed to turn it around. Uh, roll it across and have a look at what is going on in the bond markets. This is it. As I said, to you, you have two dynamics going on here. Pre Fed prevarication and Neil Kashkari uh, floating the idea of zero rate cuts. Barkin wants, uh, it says it would be smart to take time. But it is about the conflict that is raging in the Hamas-Israel war and what happens next in the escalation risk. And it should be noted uh, that RBC are talking about the scale of escalation could be a lot bigger than we've seen before. As I say, oil is up $90.72, dollar yen. There is no actual sign yet of intervention, just verbal intervention from Kishida, the Prime Minister, you just heard from Richard Ku, the pain of this weekend for the domestic economy. The Bank of Japan will be nimble, so says the Prime Minister. Your question is whether they hike again into the second half of this year. Let's talk about those bond markets. They are grappling with heightened geopolitical risks, as I've just said, in the Middle East. Oil trading above $90. And then we have that Fed speak, Kashkari floating the possibility of no rate cuts this year. So my next guest says this, it's about the quits number. That's the focus. I think the quits rate is far more important than indicated. It is stable. It's back to pre-pandemic levels, suggesting we are past the peak in the labor market and coming to balance, coming back into balance, and that wage pressures will continue to abate in the first and second quarter lag. It is Tim Graff, head of EMEA Macro Strategy over at State Street. So you're a quits man rather than a jobs man, and you say that we will continue the disinflation, the holy disinflation. That's a bit of a call. Good morning. Morning, Manus. Good to see you. Yeah, I think the quits rate has led wage growth, and wage growth as measured by the Fed's preferred measure, the Employment Cost Index. It's led it by one to two quarters for the last... 20 to 25 years. It was a far better leading indicator for wages during the stages of the pandemic. And I don't see any reason for that to be any different. It's not to say that the labor market is weak yet. It's just as, as the quote said that you read, it's coming into balance mm -hmm. and wages are getting back to a level that are no longer really inflationary or disinflationary. So in, in your own inimitable style, your words, I don't stress about inflation or the Fed having to delay their cuts into the third quarter or the fourth quarter. But what does that do to the bond market? Because we've seen yeah. how we had a little miniature shakedown this week when we thought it was going to be a an extension into later. You're a pickupper of duration and steepeners, I presume, from that comment. You quite like these spikes. They give you the opportunity to re-enter. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if I had a view that was wrong over the last few months, it was thinking duration would do a little bit better in the first quarter than it did. But I still think there's opportunity there insofar as if wage pressures continue to abate, that should help take care of core service price inflation and remove that as a potential tail risk for fixed income. And so I like adding duration to what is already a portfolio that is still overweight equities, still has a little bit of cash. You're going to be able to earn 5% annualized on your cash for probably the better part of this year. But I do think the inflationary dynamics, the, 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 the strength in January and February will probably start to abate a little bit. And just that normal lagged effect from a, a balanced labor market should also bring it closer into line and allow duration to perform a little bit better. And then, of course, you have geopolitical risks. I mean, these are the unknown unknowns. And as we've seen over the last 24 hours, fixed income can get a bid, even if you're seeing higher oil prices and potential future headline inflation as a consequence of those geopolitical risks. Yeah, it's interesting. Oil at $90. I mean, you, you know, you, everybody's going to start writing about $100 oil. When, when does the spike in oil and higher oil really materially matter to, to the Fed and to the cutting narrative or to the inflation narrative, which are, which are co-joined? I think it only really matters if you have inflation expectations become de-anchored, which there was a risk of that at the very early stages of the hiking cycle that the Fed had to address. 
uh, in, in tightening policy. There is, at this point, zero risk of that. Inflation expectations have been very stable and are nowhere near as toppy as they once were. If that gets out of control as a consequence of energy prices, then perhaps they have to think about that. But I really don't see that as being the case because the Fed can't do much about higher oil prices. They can't print barrels of oil. They can't do much about of anything on the supply side of the economy. And so I suspect unless it gets really disorderly and really disrupts expectations, okay. they'll probably just look through it. Um for risk at the moment, a lot of people have said to me, man, stop worrying about whether we get one cut, two cuts, three cuts, or any cuts this year. Risk can continue and endure. And you say that it's still a great uh, setup for markets. We do see institutional investors. We do not see institutional investors over their skis generally. Uh, they own the MAG7, a bit of EMFX, uh, but the risk, but neither of those are particularly silly risks to take and we like both. Are you adding to those? I mean, you have a great line about, you know, if it's good and it's expensive, it, you know, there's a reason why it's expensive. And I like your analogy. So you don't think equity risk is expensive at the moment? You, where, where do you add? Where do you materially add at the moment, Tim? I don't know if you necessarily add to it, but I think if you've been overweight equities versus fixed income, they do look, it looks a little bit frothy. It looks a little bit toppy. And that's where my view on duration comes in. You can start to allocate a little bit more towards fixed income. So I don't know if you would necessarily add to it at this point. I just don't think you would want to get out of it, particularly the overweights in IT and communication services. These are companies that earnings prospects are fantastic. Growth has been fantastic. In a higher rate environment, they're still earning money because of all the, 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 the huge cash balances that they have. Those are still stocks you want to own. Um, it's just that you might also want to think about balancing your portfolio a little bit, given I think inflation risks are receding, and I think duration can perform a little bit better than it has done in the first quarter. Yeah, just to sum up there, anything, if, if big caps are expensive, but so is anything that's really good. There's a lot of good restaurants in London that are expensive. Some of them aren't that good. Now, Tim, uh, you've got a very clear view on Swiss, uh, and I quite like this, because you would talk about the institutional market still being overweight Swiss, but you, are, yep. you, you have a punchy call here. You want to be long pretty much everything against the Swiss, in the majors, that is. I think so, yeah. I mean, short Swiss is a massive consensus trade. But as you mentioned, the institutional holdings we have of currencies show that they're still overweight. The franc on a real effective exchange rate basis is still a little bit expensive. Export growth in Switzerland has really cratered and growth and inflation, as we saw the other day, has been completely transitory inflation there. And so there's no need for the SMB to, to not pursue further aggressive rate cuts simply because the growth dynamics in the export channel there is so much weaker. And so it's a consensus short but it's one that I think still has unwind potential when it comes to the holdings of institutional investors. And I think the S&B will be proactive on easing and talking down the franc as well to support growth. Okay, uh, Tim, good to have you back on the show. Uh, come join us. Let's see, uh, let's see what we get in this jobs report today uh, and what it means for FedSpeak. Tim Graff of State Street, my guest uh, ahead of the jobs report. Developing nations around the world are grappling with the choice of allegiance to the US or China. And it's especially tough for Argentina. Six recessions over the last decade and 276% inflation have made the country financially dependent on Beijing. Argentina's President Javier Mele sat down with Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite for an exclusive conversation. As for the Chinese government, what we've always said is that we are libertarians. And if people want to do business with China, they can carry on business as usual. What I said was that I wouldn't be aligning with communists. Um, and that's precisely one of the things. Who did I say I was going to align with? The United States and Israel. Do you have any doubt that that's my alignment, United States and Israel? No, but in fact, you have a very good, very good example at the moment, and I'll come back to Israel and the United States later. But now, as you know, in Argentina, the focus is on a Chinese space station in Patagonia that your predecessor allowed to get built. The US says that the space station has military purposes. Um, will you close it down? Well, the point is this. Negotiations are beginning to uh, audit and inspect that because the Chinese say that is not the case. So we will move towards a situation. We will be looking at that. So that is not a problem either. Is a, is a factor in this the fact that you have that $18 billion currency swap line with China 
which you do need. You need it for the reserves at the, at the central bank. It's a big portion. Does that influence your thinking on China? That situation has to do with an agreement that was entered into and which has to do with the trade exchanges between countries. I won't modify trade exchanges because I think there are trade exchanges between privates. Just as we have a part in our central bank, uh, they have, of course, their uh, central bank counterpart. I don't see a problem. And honestly, the uh, trade relations haven't changed. Not a problem. The problem would be if I was the Chinese government and, I, and, and you called me an assassin, I might be less keen to renew the currency line. Have trade relations changed? They haven't. Not one bit. So that is actually counterfactual. There's no truth. That was Argentina's President Javier Millet speaking to Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, in an exclusive conversation. We've been talking about commodities through the past 40 minutes. It is certainly part of the zeitgeist of markets at the moment. We just heard from Tim Graff there uh, that unless inflation expectations become unanchored, then this rise in, in the price of Brent and WTI, Brent being in of above $90, is not that disconcerting. There is a fear in the oil market about the retaliatory strike by Iran. And RBC say it is appreciably, could be appreciably more forceful than previous retaliatory actions. Gold is back on the green. Uh, we did come back off our record high uh, as we saw sixth week of advances out of the past seven uh, and crude in WTI just slips by an eighth of one percent. Coming up, President Biden toughens his stance on the support for Israel with a warning. More on the story. That's next on Bloomberg. Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Cranny in New York. President Biden's having a busy week of phone calls with leaders around the world. This time, pressing the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, about safeguarding civilians. The White House writing about the conversation, quote, the president made clear that the U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by the assessment of Israel's immediate action on steps to address civilian harm. And this comes after the Israeli strike killed seven aid workers in Gaza earlier this week. Joining us now from Tel Aviv is Bloomberg's Ethan Bronner. Ethan, uh, what are the details of the readout of the Biden-Netanyahu call? Well, I think you summed it up well, Manus. I mean, the president basically said, uh, we're, we're going to shift our policy unless you, which means of support of Israel's war in Gaza, unless you take major steps to safeguard the safety uh, of civilians and and you know so the, the and, and to bring in humanitarian aid so the Israelis have opened up the Ashdod port and the Eras crossing and they're theoretically going to be moving vast amounts in one of the problems is not the supply but the distribution on the ground and we'll see if they can handle that what is the greatest fear then for Netanyahu is it about arms support political support what, what would be the biggest pivot well, that the White House think, could deliver. <clears throat> Look, I, the, the, uh, the White House has delivered about 200 shipments of arms and munitions to Israel for this war. If it were to stop delivering those arms and munitions, that would be quite a blow to Israel. I don't really think Israel can carry out this war without U.S. help. So, yes, that would be the biggest thing. That's unlikely at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the whole sort of zeitgeist of American support for Israel is having an effect here. Uh, there are people worried about it. Look, we, we're seeing images here of protests on the street earlier in the week, really s significant protests um, against Netanyahu. We're also seeing the war coalition calls for early elections, earlier elections from Gantz, etc. Is the pressure building on Netanyahu or is it, is it media interpretation? Well, the media do love pressure on Netanyahu. That's, there's no doubt about that. But it is not fake. It is real. The pressure is real. Uh, uh, the question is, will it, what will it yield and on what kind of timetable? But there's no doubt that uh, if Gantz and, and Eisenhower and those in the center of this coalition 
push for early elections and the and, uh, and several hundred thousand people go out into the street demanding it and there are other pressures from the right and the religious with regard to the uh, call up of uh, ultra orthodox uh, young men so all of this could conceivably lead to something giving before the elections of 26 it's hard to know exactly when and how but there's no doubt that the pressure has grown uh, and also you know every time there's a, a screw up like there was uh, with the uh, essential uh, uh, world kitchen folks who were killed, uh, that um, makes people here less eager to keep going. RBC say that there will be an appreciably more forceful than previous re retaliatory actions by the Iranians in response to the Israel hit on the assets in Syria. Rapidin Energy are talking to me about a 30% probability of a, a, of a material ratcheting in the Persian Gulf. Ethan, how much concern is there about the Iran backlash? So it's an interesting question because in Israel there's an enormous preparation for it. it they called up their, they, they, they called up reserves for air defenses, they um, scrambled the GPS systems across Israel to make it harder for any missiles to come in here uh, and they beefed up their air defenses and so forth. Now part of this is because the last thing Israel wants now is to be seen to be caught unaware of the way it was on October 7th. Yep. That is the last thing. So I think that there's kind of over preparation given their calculation of what's likely to happen but they uh, but it turns out their calculations haven't been always precise, so they are, they are preparing very, okay. very heavily for it. Ethan, stay safe, and thank you for joining us. That is Ethan Bronada in Tel Aviv. Uh, oil rose for a fourth day, and this is on the escalation in tensions in the Middle East, pushing Brent above $90, as we've been saying to you, uh, trading through a five-month high. Anthony DiPaolo is tracking the oil prices for us and this story. Anthony, um, is this geopolitical premium now beginning to balloon Caught up with Bob McNally the other day from Rapidin. He talks about a $40 at geopolitical premium. Good afternoon. Good morning. Hi, man. It's good afternoon and good morning. Yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, it, it is a, a geopolitical premium that is coming into oil. We have had a, a few dollars of that there as we've seen the uh, Houthi attacks on vessels around the Red Sea area. That hasn't interrupted supply. Uh, that's delayed uh, shipments of goods, of uh, oil, of fuels, and that's added to some price. But what we're talking about now, uh, concern about a potential uh, Iranian retaliation against Israel or even potentially against U.S. assets in the region would be a, 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 some potential impact on supply, and that would cause oil to, to jump up even more. Uh, so it's good that you mentioned uh, Bob McNally's uh, forecast there. Uh, I mean, he is talking about a much bigger jump if there is uh, any kind of interruption of supplies. What we've seen in oil so far uh, has been a lot more muted than a lot of uh, people would have expected, a lot of observers would have thought uh, looking at oil, but that's because we haven't seen the supplies impacted yet. Again, we've seen some uh, longer voyages, some rising costs, but there hasn't been an interruption of supplies. If we do see that, that will cause a, a, an oil price to spike. We are seeing in oil now also a lot of fundamentals uh, that are affecting uh, the price. We've seen some financial flows coming in. Uh, we've seen high demand for fuels. So that is also affecting the price from the fundamental point of view, Manus. And then, of course, we've got OPEC Plus. They're going to be watching uh, for any signs of demand destruction. That's going to be the next conversation that we're going to be ha hearing. Um, does it really, I mean, if we trade through this 90 through up to $100, does it reignite a serious discussion are by OPEC Plus releasing some supply back at the June meeting? Yeah, if the prices continue to be high, that's going to give OPEC Plus potentially more uh, comfort in bringing some of that oil back. They're going to be really watching what's going on in terms of supply coming from other uh, producers outside of the group. That's uh, the U.S., uh, that's Guyana, that's Brazil. Uh, they're adding production, and that's expected to make up for a lot of the additional demand uh, that is forecast for this year. Demand so far is coming on a little bit stronger than expectations uh, this year. Uh, that's why we're seeing that run up. It's obviously helped because OPEC is limiting supply. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be re that, really that, that trade off later in the year, whether they see demand continuing strong enough 
and they see room uh, to bring those prices, uh, that, that production in, to keep those prices around where they are now, which is kind of the sweet spot uh, for OPEC, where they'd like to see them now, minus. Anthony, thank you so much. Anthony DiPaolo there, uh, the very latest on the oil price. Brent trading above $90, uh, and many people will begin to talk about $100 oil. Coming up, a look at some of the market moving events to set your clock by, guess what? It is Jobs Day. Good morning from New York. It is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manus Cranny in New York. Let's take a look at what's ahead for you today. The main event is the jobs report at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Then we get a little bit more Fed speak for you. Susan Collins at 8.30 a.m. Laurie Logan at 11 a.m. And today is Apple's deadline to comply with the EU's order strike to strike abusive clauses in its contracts with App Store developers. So we're counting down to that. Some names that may well be worth reflecting on for the day. Uh, AMD, uh, we had one of the biggest drops since August last year. Taiwan's chip giant uh, resumes operations. That's on Taiwan Semiconductor after the deadly quake. And then Tesla enlisting Apple uh, to prove a Model X driver who worked for the iPhone maker was playing a video game on his phone when he crashed and died. Uh, a lot of other things going on across some of these names. Uh, this is a snapshot of risk for you as we go to Jobs Day. The whisper number's up at 233. Consensus is around 214. Stocks have a bounce back after one of the biggest intraday moves since the autumn of last year, and the dollar is flat. That's it for Bloomberg Brief this week. Surveillance takes you through the jobs numbers.